This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Next week. Okay. Sorry, I'm not there. Three, two, one. We're live. Live. Lou, Lou Pugliarisi in Washington, uh, the CEO of EPRINC, and me, Jay Fidel, here on Think Tech, here on Energy in America. We are so excited to be together with Lou again um, to investigate all these fantastic trends that are happening. So many changes. If you thought things were changing in general, they're also changing in energy, and why not? They're changing on both sides of it. They're changing on the renewable side and on the fossil fuel side, believe it or not. And so we have to keep track of this, especially, especially in Hawaii. Lou, welcome back to the show. It's always nice to have you here. Great to be here, Jay. Great, Great to be here. So let's look at your slides first, sort of get warmed up on well, things. Well, I was going to take you. I think it's an interesting thing. To think. So I, I, I thought about what we start out with this. Look at what happened in the particular utility, you know, people take it the support side. But look at the first slide. It shows you the... Uh, what we call the utility scale solar PV historical trend. Right. Okay. You can see there's either two kinds of uh, uh, pictures here in this slide. On the left is the uh, what we call fixed tilt, right? The, and on the right is one axis track. So one axis. Uh, follows the, uh, the fixed shelves you go stuck where you are. Okay, and now you're going to have to explain all that to our audience so they know what you're yeah, talking so about. You you can, when you generate a large solar farm, farm you, you can, can have, have it uh, sit out there, there on a kind of fixed shelf, maybe move, move uh, 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 you know, the tilt can be changed a little bit, but mostly it's fixed. And you just capture the sun as the earth moves about the sun. The uh, so-called one-axis tracker moves with the sun, so you can absorb the, the, the photonic cells can absorb more of the sun for a longer period of time mm -hmm. during the day. And I think the, the thing I wanted to say about this this slide is this picture. You can see that the cost of the, you know to build a solar farm requires a lot of different things. There's so-called soft costs, Sales, taxes, overhead. There's a labor cost, hardware, the inverters, and the modules. And the modules are the yellow part, right? Mm -hmm. The modules are not everything. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, modules are less than half the cost now. Yet uh, we have a long uh, battle uh, with the Chinese and the cost of. Uh, the uh, low cost, the, the subsidized actions they, they take, take, and it's been hurting, hurting the, the production of modules by the U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, on January 23rd, the, the Trump administration issued a proclamation announcing new tariffs on imported solar cells and modules. And this is in response to a trade petition, so called 201 petition. And uh, this is an outcome of two companies, NEPA later joined by a company called Solar World. They took their case before the International Trade Commission mm -hmm. in Act 2017, alleging that Asian companies unfairly built the price of solar cells and modules to unsustainable level. There's a big debate with the renewable fuels community on this, right? Some people say, look, the real issue is getting these things deployed, and the real, you know, the real payoff is Getting them in the field, not so much making them. Yeah, the Chinese did a lot of subsidies and government intervention, but this is just going to make it more more expensive for us to deploy it. So, uh, and uh, you know, so, so so I think that uh, so the president decided to do this, and I don't think it's going to kill the solar industry. Uh, it, uh, it's going to take some time for them to sort of parse out the impact. But, so I thought, I thought this would be a good kind of jumping point to go ahead and uh, talk about, you know, how do we, how do we kind of measure the role of solar against all the other fuels going forward? Absolutely. But before we leave this slide, though, yeah, I, there are a couple yeah. of questions about it. Sure, so sure. The one, the one on the left is a fixed solar panel. The one on the right, right. is a tracker. Okay, so it right, sounds right, like, right. And, and the number at the top, uh, the top of each is what? It's the uh, amount, uh, the cost or the amount of energy generated? What is that? 
So that's the cost of for a hundred megawatts. Okay. So basically, you know, those are the, the you know, so the top of the scale is six dollars. Yeah. So, so if you go back to 210, you were paying five dollars and forty-four cents for 100, 100 megawatts, and we're down to where didn't really use a fixed scale or access a buck, about a dollar. Okay, so it looks to me, if if you follow this chart, it looks to me like we're actually spending less. Uh, I guess that's per kilowatt hour, less per kilowatt hour uh, in 2017 using the uh, the fixed uh, tilt. Uh, then using the dollar uh, fifteen My, uh, tracker. The, the, neither, neither one, one of these, these deal with the question we call, call kind of the availability or how much of this capacity is available, available to you at any one, one point in time. And yeah. I'm going to get to that, that a, bit a bit later. later but uh, uh, okay, yeah, well, let's 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 move forward and talk about the comparison of uh, photovoltaic yeah, so uh, let's go to the and, next. and other fuels, especially in light of the tariff. So we can get off this slide and, and look directly yeah, at let's you. let's go to the next slide. Just, I, just, I just want to show, show you that, that the, uh, this, uh, this slide, slide is a kind of, kind of uh, just a document that, that we are growth in installed and annual photovoltaic is growing rapidly. rapidly. And we expect, and we expect to continue to, continue to grow, grow through, uh, uh, through uh, uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And the cumulative and forecast, forecast from 2016 to 2020 is going to be about 387 gigawatts. That's a lot of power. That's a lot, a lot of power. But remember, it's only when the sun is shining. That power is not available to you. And although we've talked about this before, you need some way to store that energy that's not available after the sun goes down. Yes. What is the blue line on this chart, Lou? Is there a blue line and some blue legends there? The blue line is the average annual growth rate. So the so the so the average growth rate is in about nine percent. Okay, that's pretty good. I think, I if, think you if you talk, talk to people in the environmental community, they're very excited. excited. This fantastic. fantastic. This, this must, must mean we can get off of fossil fuels, right? Yes. This must this mean we're not going, going to need, need them so much for the future. Well, that's and demand, though. Uh, you know, it, uh, you're not cranking supply into this chart. There's only only demand, yeah? Right, right. 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 Only, only demand. Only demand. I mean, so this demand, demand is going, is going to, be, to be met. So, okay. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Because I, I think the next, the next slide, slide is very interesting. interesting. This, this was just, just released, released today. today. Okay. And this and is the, the energy, energy consumption, consumption forecast, forecast, right? The so-called so reference date, but the, the U.S. Department, Department of Energy, independent agency, agency called the, the Energy Information, Information Agency, the U.S. CIA, a very uh, respected, uh, you know, data collection and analysis agency of the Department of Energy. It was created in the mid-70s after the Arab oil embargo. It produces lots of data and analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at there, and, and what we're going to look at today is what we call the reference case, right? Okay. And the reference case is kind of their best guess of everything else being equal. This is kind of how it's likely to play out given current policy. No major change in current policy. And current policy is continue subsidies for a few years on uh, solar and wind, uh, renewable, so-called renewable portfolio standards or feed-in tariffs by the state. So this, this embeds in this forecast all the things the federal government is doing and all the things the states are doing to encourage the use of renewable fuel. Uh -huh. So I would start first with the, uh, on, on the left, the consumption by sector, right? Okay. And you can see, and this is done in what we call quadrillion British thermal units, or quads in the business, right? Okay. And that, that, that's a lot of power, and uh, I can, uh, next time we talk, I can give you that number in equivalents of barrels of oil or gas. So, you know, the U.S. will, will uh, you know, if you take the, Today, 
which is where we are here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me just hang on a second. I don't know what's going on all of a sudden. So if you take where we are here, uh, we're going to continue to see growth in electric power. Right? Yes. A lot of that is proje that's projection now, but by a respected organization. Yeah. It's pretty good. You know, it's not, it's not a crazy number if they show kind of modest growth. Yeah. Uh, industrial use is going to grow, industrial use of energy. Yeah. And transportation is going to grow that much, right? Right. Transportation is going to kind of decline, so gasoline consumption is going to decline, more fuel efficient. But eventually it turns around. Okay, just, just to be clear, though, you're talking about energy in general? Not any specific? Yes, this is all sources. So we're going to go to the fuel types in a second. And we're talking about the country, the, the national numbers. The whole United States. So this is for the whole, whole United States. Including Hawaii. Including Hawaii. There you go. <laughs> now, if you move to the right side, the energy consumption by fuel, which is really the more sort of interesting area for us, uh, you can see that petroleum and other liquids, so this would be gasoline, diesel fuel, ethanol, probably, uh, well, maybe some of the ethanol is down in renewable, but mo mostly gasoline and diesel, liquid petroleum gas, LPG, uh, the stuff you use for the tiki lights in Hawaii, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that actually, they show that declining and then slowly recovering to, you know, almost where it is now by 2050. So we don't see a lot of demand in what we call the liquids piece in the U.S., right? I, I, well, I see petroleum, that's the, that's the top line, petroleum declining at first and then, and then uh, ascending again. Recovering a bit. So this is gasoline, diesel fuel, liquid petroleum gas, probably, you know, uh, condensate. Uh, petrochemical feedstock, these yeah. kinds of things. I don't see any renewables on the right-hand side of this chart. Oh, you haven't seen them yet. We're going to get to them, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we oh, I see. I see it's down below, and it says other renewable yeah, yeah. energy. Okay, there it is. Natural gas grows uh, substantially, right? Yes. And this is largely, you need to, part of this is export, part of this is, uh, well, that's not export, but this is the industrial sector and the utility sector. Mm -hmm. Well, so you need a lot of gas to back up the renewables. Yes. And then you see we have a decline. Coal continues to decline and kind of flattens off. Yeah. And then we have something called other renewable energy. Yes. And the reason they call it other renewable energy is because they don't put hydroelectric power in there. Ah. Often people want to show a big increase or a big percentage of renewable power, they bury the hydropower in there. Uh -huh. But hydropower really isn't that new. Yeah. We've had dams for a long time. So the EIA has separated out hydropower from other renewable energy. This is largely wind and solar. Okay. Yes. And you can see that wind and solar grow. But it, out of the total, you know, it, it's... Uh, you know, it's only going to account for about uh, 14 uh, quadrillion uh, BTUs, quads, mm -hmm. 14 quads. Right? Okay. It'll be about equivalent to coal in 2050. Nuclear decline and uh, hydroelectric power kind of remains constant, and as does uh, what we call uh, liquid biofuels. Okay. This is uh, ethanol and whatever you guys do in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Little... And we're having a program about that next hour, yeah. Yeah, so you can talk, you can kind of wring your hands over the tariffs. You can talk a lot about solar and stuff, but these are official forecasts from the U.S. government. Okay, on that and note, on that note, Lou, we're going to take, take a very short break. We're going to sort of integrate this. And we're going to come yeah. back and we're going to talk about the implications of it and the intersection of these numbers that you've given us, these charts, and policy. Woohoo! We'll right. be right back, Lou. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me.
afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Uh, at, in, in the uh, uh, Chinese department. Okay, that's Lou Pugliarisi talking about his son who has a scholarship to the University of, was it Nanjing, did you say? And he's a Manoa student. He's, Manoa he's, student. See, see what happens, you know. Hawaii does have a connection by way of Washington to Nanjing. <laughs> <laughs> so you have some more slides that you want to you present to yeah, round the picture out. I want to some more slides to help maybe explain what's going on here. The first slide is, uh, the next slide we have is, I call this, this is actually the courtesy of a good friend of mine, a brilliant physicist by the name of Mark Mills. He's a venture capitalist, also works at the, he also is a scholar at the Manhattan Institute. Uh -huh. And this is called, the title of this slide is Dueling Chemistries, right? Uh -huh. And here's the interesting question. How much, if you think about an automobile, you want to know how far you can go for a pound of something, right? How far will a pound of, uh, uh, of fuel, of diesel fuel or gasoline take you? And how far will a pound of a lithium battery take you? And if you look at this data and you get all we know about physics in the known universe, or at least in our current universe, you know, not an alternative universe, but in our universe, and you double the lithium battery. And this is really the extension of what we can do with the chemistry and the physics. Uh -huh. We can probably go a mile a pound. Okay. Over time. Okay. But for a pound of diesel or gasoline, we can go seven times more. And the gasoline engines are also getting more efficient. So the first thing, we still have this problem with battery technology, right? It's just not as efficient, not as cost effective, and just doesn't take you as far as a pound. Mm -hmm. And remember, if we're going to do all this electric battery, we're going to have to mine lots of lithium around the world. We're going to have to accept those environmental costs from that. So I think that's something we should uh, we keep in mind that we still have to fix this problem. The second part, the, the last slide I want to talk to you about, why might the EIA numbers be correct? You know, what is it about the EIA, EIA numbers? If you think about the EIA forecast, it's basically a cost-based model. Mm -hmm. You know, the government policy is in there, but <clears throat> it has certain limits. So when they run their big NEMS model, this monster model of the U.S. economy, mm -hmm. they put the costs in here. And this, this chart is very interesting. If you look at, on the left side, you have, what can you get for a million dollars of capital expenditures? Okay. That's what the CapEx expense. Mm -hmm. So if I put a million dollars, into a shale well, right? Mm -hmm. I can probably get 400 barrels of oil equivalent production over time. You know. mm -hmm. uh, I can get in a wind turbine, if I put that much money, 90, and a lot less in a solar, right? Okay, yeah. So that's one story. So right now, capital expenditures yield more energy output for a million dollars in the shale deal. But let me ask you, though, if you put a million dollars into shale, you're, you're processing the shale, <clears throat> and then you've spent a million dollars, and you've processed the shale, you have the barrels of oil, 400 of them, whatever, um, and it's gone. The money's gone. There are no assets left because the million dollars doesn't include the assets. It's talking about the processing. But if you have wind, then the cost of building a wind turbine um, leaves you with a wind turbine. You still have it. And, and the cost of putting vo photovoltaic up uh, yes, you have the you have the photovoltaic energy, but you also have the panels left over. No. So both of these embedded in this is a rate of depreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay. You get depreciation in the shale well. Eventually, it declines, but mm -hmm. you also get that. In, you have to repair and fix these wind turbines. They don't last forever, and even the photovoltaics way out. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that the million dollars is is being de includes depreciated 
an but asset a base. Appreciation of the asset. Okay. But the right side is the more interesting point. Okay. The solar and wind are probably now reaching. If you look at this decline yeah. in the cost reduction, right, mm -hmm. for solar and wind, you see by twenty, by twenty thirty, you're kind of you know you're already in twenty ten. 2015 on the flat end of the cost curve. That is the asymptote is coming down as close to zero as you go. There is no more improvement in this technology in front of us. Mm -hmm. For the so so these numbers on the left reflect where we are in the terms of the improvement in this technology. The, oddly enough, the shale well probably has still a few iterative technology advances in front of it. Mm -hmm. It's not on its slope. So one of the dilemmas we face is we get a higher return for capital X and shale, and it's likely to improve, you know, maybe another 100% over the next 20 years. For the shale and wind, we're kind of done. And so we have to figure out what we do about that. Yes. You know, so, okay, that takes us to the next part of our discussion. <clears throat> How does this all, you know, you're talking about projections on, um, you know, on, on factors that are not necessarily linked to or a function of government policy. And I guess the question is, um, you know, what kind of government policy is inherent in this and what kind of changes might take place and how would those changes affect these numbers? So, um, we do know that um, first, we're going to need all the improvement we can get in batteries and solar and wind, but we're not going to get these kind of colossal transformations unless we're willing to pay a lot more. That's the conclusion I would take. Well, suppose, uh, suppose I threw, um, what, how much is the wall supposed to cost, 18 billion? Suppose I threw $18 billion at, at uh, getting, you know, better batteries. Or, or for just a small example, the cost of a military parade, uh, you know, through the center of Washington. I, <laughs> I, I know you're looking forward to that. Um, so the cost of that, what, a couple hundred million, whatever it is? Oh, Jay, have you asked me what to do with that money at the margin? Yeah. I would send it back to you rather than put it in either of those. Both of them have low return. <laughs> you know I mean? Actually, that's a good question. You know, how should we spend our money? Our yes. Public money? yes. And probably the big return is invested in human capital. We kind of have plenty of dough invested in solar and wind. We're at the end of the cost curve. And it's unclear the government has a lot more to add there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should probably may be able to do get some efficiencies in better management of the grid. Better, you know, we should we should have a decent research program. But at the margin, this yeah. suggests to be. Okay, I mean, but, but theoretically though, theoretically, I mean, if you put all the other issues aside, and you and you make a decision hypothetically. Um, that you, you, want, you want energy to be renewable. Why? Because of carbon emissions, because of, uh, may I say, COP23 uh, and the Paris Accord. Um, so, so, if so if you, you make that rate, decision, what, what do you do? So if you decided that you wanted a low-cost strategy to, re to reduce emissions, you probably should not be spending $1,800 a ton, ton for zero-emission vehicles, as California does. Instead, you probably should go to China, buy out a bunch of coal mines, and sell them LNG from America. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably only like 50 bucks a ton. <laughs> and that's the problem. It's not a local air pollution problem in the Los Angeles basin. It's a global problem. Yes, it is. And U.S. policy is on the high end of the cost curve. Yes. So what do we do, though? I mean, I, I, I mean, I know this administration is not particularly interested in environment, nor are they interested in renewables. Uh, you know, like looking at that, that uh, the coal line in the chart you showed, one of those first slides, and saying to myself, well, you know, do we really need to have that much? I mean, if, if we were concerned about fossil fuel, concerned about carbon emissions, we would take the coal off, not incentivizing it, but de-incentivizing it. Well, we could do that, but I think the EIA numbers are very instrumental in that. They are suggesting 
that the existing policies, which are largely what was in place when Obama left, right? The amount of changes the administration made are much more modest than you should believe reading the, mm -hmm. the local newspaper, okay? <laughs> uh, the clean air, you know, most of the utility sector is driven by state policy anyway. Yes, you might be able to drive the coal down a bit more. You probably are having uh, a little bit of a kind of expensive play in the nuclear side. Actually, that's one of the big dilemmas. Uh, we are disincentivizing nuclear power, or if you like, we've created a regulatory framework that makes it very difficult to build out and extend our nuclear power plants, which are emission-free. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Hawaii has a provision against it in the Constitution. It's but firmly it's embedded. The, support of nuclear, uh, it, the Constitution prohibits nuclear power? No, it requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature, I think. Okay. Uh, a special vote, a special it percent. I for Hawaii to use nuclear power as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but, you know, where, where, does, where, does this, where does this fit? Because I think, you know, the demand and the expectations, um, the, the charts, the, the, the projections on those charts, very valuable. But it also, it also you know, raises the question of, well, what do we do to massage those numbers? What do we do to... The first thing we need to do is we need to rethink our whole government legislative approach. We've tried to ram and shoehorn all this uh, climate stuff into something called the Clean Air Act. It doesn't really fit in it. You know, the Clean Air Act was aimed at getting soot out of the atmosphere in local jurisdictions, getting lead out of the fuel, things like that. This is a kind of global issue. And it may also suggest that we should have a hard think about where to allocate our money between adaption and mitigation. And my view, if, when I look at those numbers, I say, well, wow, the U.S. can probably alter those a little bit. We could put a lot of money and maybe drop the coal down a bit. You know, some people suggest you could buy out the whole coal industry for 50 to 100 billion. But 50 to 100 billion, build a lot of schools, pay a lot of welfare, write a lot of social security checks. You got to ask yourself, is it worth it? Maybe, maybe we need to rethink. Well, that's an interesting question. More on mitigation and less on, uh, I mean, more into adaption and less on mitigation. I think it's a big problem mm -hmm. and right now we're kind of stuck you know we're stuck look we have to get our emissions down yes we have to get them we probably should get them down but this is the reality what's going to happen well one of the things you mentioned uh, in our preliminary discussions was was the exxon initiative around shale can you talk about that so exxon announced that they were going to invest in the united states 50 billion dollars to produce oil and gas in the in the domestic economy. And my question is, well, why would they do that? But then you look at the EIA numbers and you say, well, they're doing that because EIA says the demand for gas is going to grow enormously in the U.S. And the Exxon is part of the world market. U.S. is exporting a lot of oil to the world market. And we are, we're going to continue to do so. Well, you know, this, this all raises the ultimate question, which I would like to ask you here at the end of our show, and that is, and that is Hawaii. So Hawaii looks at these numbers, and let's assume that the you know, government policy is, it remains pretty much the same. Uh, the, you know, the direction is pretty much the same. And so those numbers, those projections actually you know, play out. So the question is, what is Hawaii or any state you know, which has a certain interest in renewables, and we have a, you know, a very enthusiastic interest in renewables, but what do we do to fold all those projections into our planning here, with due regard for the economics? Right, so Hawaii is unique condition. It is an island economy. It has, the natural resources that it has are largely renewable, wind and solar. And so the question, that policymakers should ask themselves is why are they pursuing this policy as opposed to that policy? So is the intent of the policymakers in Hawaii to provide the lowest possible cost power to the citizens of the state of Hawaii? Or is the policy to provide 
100% renewable, so people can look good when they go to an international conference. I mean, this is really. <laughs> and the question is, that second alternative, if you're realistic, might be very, very expensive. And so probably you want to get on a path that kind of preserves the option of keeping the cost under control, but moves along and makes some progress on renewables. That makes sense. Well, that's a great, that's a great approach to it, you know. Uh, Lou, this is, this is a great discussion. We have to continue this. We have to, you know, discuss these various priorities and options and uh, see how they affect Hawaii, of course. Thank you so much for uh, coming around for a show. We'll see you in two weeks, I hope, and for okay. further discussion. Aloha. Bye-bye. Uh, she. <laughs> Thank I'm you so much. <laughs>